Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Uh, today we're going to start a uh, small unit on early atomic history. Uh, we'll get to, to modern atomic theory later, uh, but let's talk about some of the foundations that led us to where we are today. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with some of the humble beginnings of chemistry when it was just alchemy and protocytes and then get to some of the contributions of Lavoisier, Prowse, and Dalton, uh, which gave chemistry a lot of its legitimacy as a, as a true science. Um, and as we go through early atomic history, it's important to note that um, we are going to talk about a lot of ideas that are no longer true. And, uh, and so you might be saying, well, why, why bother talking about these things when they're not even what we believe today? Uh, because the sequence of the discovery uh, is important. You know, how did we get from our first model of an indivisible atom up to the planetary model, up to our modern uh, atomic theory? Um, each one of those stages has a lot of interesting stories and enlightenments about the scientific process and how we move an idea forward, how we advance a theory based on the evidence we have around them. So for each one of these, you know, make sure that you pay attention and take away uh, what these uh, ideas have to offer us in terms of, of demonstrating good science. So I kind of let this uh, out already, the idea of the early beginnings of the atom. Uh, different people are going to give different people credit, but Democritus and his mentor are often given a lot of credit for this, around four or 500 BC. Uh, it's a simple idea that if you took something and chopped it up and kept chopping it up, eventually you're not going to be able to chop it up anymore. And those tiniest particles would be indivisible building blocks. And that idea of the indivisible building block, atomos, uh, became the, the benchmark of atomic theory for over two millennia. Now again, spoiler alert, we know this isn't how atoms are now, uh, but, but this beginning uh, allowed people to start thinking about how atoms and compounds and all these things worked. So it was a great theory based on what people had around them. Um, the idea of chemistry as a discipline didn't really exist uh, on its own until uh, a couple centuries ago. In the early days, it was considered alchemy a proto-science. Um, a lot of people say it started in the, in the Nile Valley uh, around uh, the area of Chem. Um, and so of Chem, Alchem led to alchemy uh, with the Egyptians studying certain materials and, and changes. Um, the Chinese independently, of course, did a lot of stuff too. They were interested in immortality. They didn't come up with immortality that I know of, but they certainly came up with gunpowder, uh, sort of an anti-immortality there. Um, the medieval uh, Alchemists, uh, probably some of the most famous alchemists, were fascinated with the idea of transmutation, of taking what they thought were less pure, less valuable substances and bringing them to their truest form, um, gold being one of the eventual goals. Now, there was a lot of, of course, conmen and, and cheats in this, but base in this uh, was a lot of respectable scientific authorities. Isaac Newton was a big believer in alchemy. Now, we know today that you can't turn elements into other elements easily. But they didn't know that. They didn't really know the difference between elements and compounds. You saw these magical changes of, of, of chemistry. And so it wasn't a big leap to think, well, if I can turn a, a piece of wood into ash, uh, why can't I turn uh, one type of metal into another type of metal? And we'll show what people learn to get from idea A to an idea B. And so, uh, you know, al alchemy is sort of getting its uh, second renaissance in terms of uh, uh, importance in history uh, because again what a lot of what these people did um, laid the foundations for the science to follow so certainly alchemy has a has a much kinder uh, place in the history books uh, than it used to now one of the people that really get credit for taking uh, chemistry uh, and creating it from the idea of alchemy is Anton Lavoisier an interesting character certainly worth his own uh, lesson, um, but uh, he was, he, well, he, he's given credit for the law of conservation of mass. Definitely by far the most important law for a first year chemistry student, maybe any chemistry student. Because what it states, and there's different ways to state it, but long story short, uh, that mass or atoms really cannot be created nor destroyed in chemical or physical reactions. Um, what you start with is what you end with in terms of mass and actual atoms. Uh, and this idea is a huge tool uh, that we can use in the laboratory. Uh, because again, imagine a game of hide-and-go-seek where you didn't know if the person existed anymore after they hid. Uh, it would be a very frustrating game to play because you'd never know uh, when, you, when, when you found everybody you could. And the same thing goes for atoms. Um, 
you know, if, if, if you know that you have a certain amount of atoms to begin with, they're all, they all have to be there when they're done, and that's based on the law of conservation of mass. Drop a box of Legos, uh, you know that you've got to keep looking until you find all the Legos. And we owe all that to Anton Lavoisier and it's his work on the law of conservation of mass. Um, again, just, just a hugely important idea, really a, a philosophy if you want to think about it, um, you know, because everything we have is still around. Um, you know, the whole circle of life, uh, everything that we have on this planet, uh, again, it, the mass is conserved. And when you start thinking about things that way, you can get some pretty uh, epic uh, philosophical conversations going. And again, it might be worth uh, diving into a little bit more later. Uh, but, but think of an analogy of throwing stuff in a grocery bag, not quite as philosophically epic, but um, you know, if you put two pounds of this in and five pounds of that in, you're going to end up with seven pounds in that grocery bag. That's not a surprise. And if I take uh, atoms of a certain weight and add them together, the, the combined compound should be the mass of those individual things. Now, to supplement the law of conservation of mass, you, we have two other laws we're going to touch on today. The law of definite composition is also a, a very useful law to think about. Um, it still holds relevant today. Proust gets credit for this, and the idea is that a compound contains exactly the same elements and exactly the same proportions, regardless of size or source. So if you get pure water here on Earth or pure water on the Moon or pure water on Pluto, um, it's going to be exactly the same, whether it was a thimbleful, a drop, or an iceberg. Um, so the idea of this uh, with, with uh, drugs uh, that you find in the store, uh, this is a, a very common idea. You'll see this on medicines. You know, if you look carefully at the house brand, it will often say, compared to the active ingredient in Bayer aspirin, for instance. Um, and, and really what they're trying to say is, well, listen to Proust's law of definite composition. All right, if I have acetosilic acid and you have acetosilic acid, uh, it's the same thing. So it doesn't matter whether you buy the more expensive brand or the cheaper brand, it's the same active ingredient. As long as, of course, quality control remains constant, I would stay away from Bayer aspirin as opposed to Bayer aspirin. But, you know, everything's a preference. And finally today we're just going to touch on uh, Johnny Dalton. Uh, Johnny Dalton, John Dalton's going to show up a lot in this class. Uh, and he's giving credit for the law of multiple proportions. And he, he built off some of the work that Anton Lavoisier did. Um, uh, one way of looking at it, not really the correct way of looking at the law of multiple proportions, is that elements combine into small whole number ratios. Now that's not technically the law, but it's a nice takeaway point. Um, really, really the law of multiple proportions uh, states that when you have uh, different elements in a compound, um, that uh, the mass of the second element will be a ratio of whole numbers, uh, which sounds a little confusing, but if we took it to take a look at something like water and hydrogen peroxide, um, we have the hydrogen, the grams of hydrogen, and then we have the grams of oxygen. And that oxygen is that second element. And when you look at those two compounds, that's going to be a whole number ratio. And that sounds, well, somewhat big deal. Um, but it was a big deal because this was, this has allowed Dalton to start looking at uh, ratios of elements and starting to correctly assume that, you know, when we have something like carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, that the carbon dioxide is going to have twice as many oxygens. Because remember, you guys live in a world where you already know all the chemical formulas. But imagine being in a world when you had these compounds and you didn't know carbon monoxide was carbon monoxide because you didn't know what elements were in it. And so the law of multiple portions is really, really critical to the beginning of atomic theory because it allowed people to start realizing that maybe there were ratios of these atoms uh, in these compounds. And again, that's hard to wrap your, your hands around because you're used to a world where we already have all these answers. Uh, but try to put yourself on the perspective of not knowing and taking these, uh, these substances um, and starting to realize that they were made up of different things and that we could find uh, relationships between these certain things. So again, um, just, a, just a tiny little step into the world of atomic history. Uh, we're going to start talking about some of the contributions to the modern, I mean to the early atomic theory, like uh, Thompson, Millikan, uh, Rutherford, uh, and we'll get all the way to the planetary model. And then we'll take a break for a bit, and then we'll come back and modern atomic theory later. So anyway, that was a lot to cover in one lesson. Got a little more philosophical than I thought I would there, um, but uh, I hope you learned something. Uh, we appreciate you watching, and, and have a great day.